Welcome back to the world's finest assassin gets reincarnated in the world as an aristocrat. Anime review episode number six. Three anime in just a period of almost a week just happen to have their final episodes. Like, wow, this is quite something. First is Dress the World, then Mishuka Tenge, and now this one. On episode 12 of this series, yes, episode 12, which is called Battle of Assassin. Yep, that's the name of this episode. This episode from the, second, from the rest of chapter 22 goes to the entirety of 23 and adapts a portion of, of the epilogue for book one. Yep, we pick up a little off last week where Lou is basically reunited with Dia. Where you see him like hugging her and him introducing himself to her father. And of course, basically, he kind of explains his plan. She's about to give a speech to basically announce that she's going to, well, that she's going to be playing the fact that she's possibly committing suicide. But then all of a sudden, a freaking spear comes out of nowhere, goes right through the freaking window, goes right through the freaking wall. Who does this belong to? A guy by the name of. I want to be sure I get his name right. Centennial, uh, Centennial Marcus. Yes. That's who fired this thing. He was mentioned several episodes back, and now he finally makes an appearance. In the final episode of the season. Yep. Fires this thing off, and then, of course, he, be- he announces he's challenging the house to a duel, which, of course, they accept. Excuse me. So, we have Lou bringing... Bringing the Count with him. That's Dia's father. So, they go and meet the Chums. Before they go out there, he decides to make this metal spear. And then launch it someplace. Where? Space. Fire it like one of the lasers that fire... One of the satellites that fire missiles. Very similar to it. So, he accepts the challenge. But he's not going to necessarily battle him one-on-one. Nope. Well, he does, but it, the whole thing of them introducing each other, that's from the book. It was slightly a little different, so he introduced them as Fur Marcus. Uh, Marcina. That's, that's what that's, uh, I can think of. They, they, they do count the bit where they're distant relatives of the house. And he introduces himself, and of course, he, he of course, the thing that notices that he's very polite. And. Even uh, the slightly altered dialogue here is that he basically was strictly disciplined. Yeah, it's a slightly different style line of dialogue, but it's still good. So, oh, by the way, he does fire a freaking before he gets out there. He fires a cannon at him. Yes, making its first appearance in episode three. And he is like, "Wow, it's been a while since I've seen that." Wow, it's the second time he's ever used it. Yep, was referred to as gun. Stri- it's pretty much referred to as cannon strike. Yeah, it's based upon an old, like, early 20th century cannon that uh, basically is equivalent to firing a freaking tank. Yes. And he tells them to cover their ears and open their mouths. Which, that doesn't make any sense to do, but I guess they had to do it. Yep. So, he mentions him, oh yeah, you're the first person to allow me to t- taste my blood. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's what he says. So, he's about, he tells his men to basically back up. He asks, like, he, uh, kind of back up so he won't get hurt. Like, okay. That seems pretty reasonable. Then, at, afterwards, they're about to start fighting. Of course, he summons a knife. Yes, he creates a knife. And then, all of a sudden, at that very second, the missile comes right off the ground. They do explain in a flashback of how the heck he made this thing. And it's based upon something he saw in his, in his original life. Which is interesting, before I continue here, I have to talk about the very start of the episode. Where apparently the goddess herself has decided to step into one of the jewels for some reason. And apparently that led into, like, the events of the pilot episode. Which is quite interesting, the fact that did that. So, after it's destroyed, then of course, where Dia, of course he heals up his leg... Not his gut per se, but he also is bleeding from the head. And then, of course, thinks he's going to die here. But no, here's Dia, the woman he loves. 
happy to come for him. And of course, basically, she thanks him for saving her life. Call about debts for paid. And then he kisses her. Yep, he kisses her. In case you're curious, though, did he do this in the book, too? Yes, he did. And her reaction to it is spot on. Where she's like, what are you... Oh, and then she proceeds to make out with him, too. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember if, in fact, the, the kiss they had a few a couple of years back, if that was canon, per se. But this one definitely is. Now, there is the next bit here is actually a bit of a change, per se, after, after that. Where we have... Lou and Dia, that when they go back to Lou's house, in the book they do it on foot. In the anime, they do it via carriage. Put out of it, they made this change, and you have Tarty, where she basically... We do have this brief cutaway where, and this is completely unoriginal, where Kane gets a, a note from Lou that, that this guy might be the hero, even though it really isn't. Yeah, the hero herself, it's a woman, she does not make appearance until the last 30 seconds of the episode. That's when she finally shows up. The hero that was mentioned way back in the pilot episode finally shows up in the last 30 seconds, which I'll get to that. Mentioned with the hero, but don't worry that she comes back later. And apparently Tarty has been sleeping, like, not really sure why she's basically with... with... Lou's mom. In the book, basically, she's mentioned she was sleeping all this time. Here, they don't mention it at all. And, then of course, they have Dia and Tarty see each other. In the book, basically, they kind of have instructions for each other in the epilogue, which they completely cut that out. They cut a lot of stuff from the epilogue. It's like they have portions of the epilogue, but not the entirety of it. After she walks home, they basically cut to the other room. It's a slightly different dialogue here, where they did mention that Dia will be brought into the family as the as the younger sister to Lou. Mainly because of her youthfulness, despite the fact she's three years older than he is. Yep. And <laughs> then of course right after this particular thing. Then we cut to looks like a school. We see a carriage pull up, and then we see So Walk Out, who just happens to be the hero. Epina Ranhan. Yes, that's the person's name. In the book, she does not make appearance until book two of the series. Yes, that is actually her first appearance in... Her first appearance is in this very book right here. And if you're curious what the heck she looks like... That's her. That's the hero. This by fact, it looks like a guy. It's a woman. They reveal this in this book right here, which... I hope they actually get to it. They hope, I hope they get a season two out of this. I hope so. Yep. But yeah. There's all these hopes I've adapted this one book. Though not, they didn't finish that in the epilogue book. So they might adapt that later on as an extra or whatever. But I hope they do. But yeah, this is absolutely a really good episode. And I do recommend checking the series out. Okay, so... Excuse me, that's it for Circle of You. Next one's going to be, well, I'm going to do one more video for this series, and that's going to be pretty much it, per se, for this interview series for now until I do something else with it. I'm going to do an episode 7, where I'm going to do my final thoughts on the series, okay? Oh, the season, anyways. See you next video. Bye.